Hi everyone, welcome to chapter 7. We're going to begin looking at bones, bone tissue. This is the second and final chapter for unit 2, I'm sorry, for unit 3, and this will also uh, be a three lecture long chapter. Each of the lectures will be relatively brief compared to our normal lectures. So let's go ahead and start with our not really attendance questions. First, to what class of tissues does bone belong? And second, what is the stimulus for melanin production? Go ahead and try to answer those with the video paused and come back and see if your answers were correct. And let's see what the correct answers are. What class of tissues does bone belong? Bone is a connective tissue. Sometimes you'll hear it called osseous tissue, which we will talk about today. But it is a connective tissue, along with things like cartilage and dense irregular and blood and things like that. What is the stimulus for melanin production? So this goes back to our skin chapter. Melanin, remember, that's that pigment that darkens the skin, and its stimulus is actually DNA damage from ultraviolet radiation. Once that damage occurs, then melanin production uh, begins at a faster rate. So if you see someone with a tan, what did we say about that? It means that DNA damage has already occurred. So let's go ahead and dive into our second body system that we will be studying this semester, the skeletal system. And really what we're going to be talking about specifically in this chapter is bone. So there is more to the skeletal system than just bone. We will be focusing on the bone aspect. So what is the function or what are the functions of the skeleton? Well, support. That's the obvious one. It gives shape to your body. It provides support for all of the tissues uh, to keep your body in that kind of upright body shape. Also, a lot of the organs in your gut area, like your stomach, your intestines, things like that, they are actually anchored to bones so that they don't just kind of all sink down and collect in your pelvic region. Next, protection. This is probably one of the more obvious ones, uh, going way back to one of the first things that we talked about in Chapter 1, Atlas A. Bones are there to protect our organs. Our skull protects our brain. Our rib cage protects our lungs and our heart. Our pelvis pro partially protects uh, our gonads and part of our intestines. So bones really are there to provide a pretty good degree of protection. Movement. Now this can be a little bit tricky. Um, bones themselves are not responsible for movement. Everything that moves in the body is moving as the result of muscle. So bones are not actually causing movement, but the muscles move the bones. So the muscles give points of attachment the bones give points of attachment for the muscle so that when the muscle contracts, it causes our body to move. Electrolyte balance. So our body is very dependent on things like calcium and phosphate ions, which we'll talk about later in the semester. We've mentioned briefly already, but we'll talk about quite a bit when we get to nerves and muscles. And when we have too much of these electrolytes, we don't really eliminate much of them in urine or feces. Instead, our bones act as a bank. We deposit these electrolytes, these charged particles, into our bones. And then later, if we need them, we can withdraw these electrolytes from our bones. Next. Hematopoiesis. Hematopoiesis is blood formation. That's just the proper term for making blood. Inside of our bones, we've got something called red bone marrow, and that's where blood is made. 
pH homeostasis. Uh, sometimes you'll hear this called pH balance or acid-base balance. I think our book uses acid-base balance, but I don't like that term because we don't really want balance to occur because that kind of implies that everything's neutral and we'll learn in 139. That's not the case. So pH homeostasis is a better term for this. And uh, we can do this because the bones can absorb things like phosphate or uh, bicarbonate, things like that, uh, to regulate our body's pH. And finally, hormone production, which we really won't talk about in this chapter, but I do want you to know that this is uh, something that bones do. And bones produce a hormone called osteocalcin, and osteocalcin helps regulate how our body handles calcium, but we will not be discussing that in this chapter. So bones, uh, sometimes called osseous tissue, but e they're not exactly the same thing. So let's see what the difference is. Osseous tissue is a connective tissue that has a matrix of uh, hardened material, and that hardening comes from calcium mostly. A few other materials go into it, but it's mostly calcium. So it is a calcium-hardened matrix connective tissue. And that hardening process is called mineralization or calcification. So we take a connective tissue, we mineralize it, or we calcify it. And then what we end up with is osseous tissue. Now, bone and osseous tissue sometimes are used interchangeably. I actually tend to use them interchangeably, and you're welcome to also. But what I would like you to know is that technically bone contains osseous tissue plus some other tissues. Things like bone marrow, red and yellow bone marrow. Um, there's also going to be a little bit of cartilage and a few other things. So really, technically, bone and osseous tissue are not the same thing. But for purposes of our class, we can use them interchangeably. Now let's talk about, and this really is more of a lab topic, but I do want to briefly mention it here. One way that we can classify bones is by their shape. And bones come in different shapes. So let's look at some of those here. First, over here we see something called a flat bone. And flat bones, we can find a few different places in the body. Here it shows us the sternum, the hard bone in the middle of the chest. A lot of the bones of the skull are also flat bones. And flat bones, just like they sound, they're pretty flat. Next, we have long bones. Long bones, by definition, are longer than they are wide. And the bones of the arms and legs, except for the wrist and ankles and the kneecap, the bones of the arms and legs, except for the wrists and ankles and kneecap, those are long bones because they are longer than they are wide. Next, we have short bones. Short bones are roughly cube-shaped. They're not exact cubes, but they are roughly cube-shaped. We find those in the wrists and the ankles. And there is a special type of short bone called a sesamoid bone. Sesamoid bones resemble sesame seeds. And we all have the same flat bones, long bones, short bones, and irregular bones. But sesamoid bones are typically very small, around the size of a grain of sand. And we find them in joints, especially the sutures of the skull but they're scattered around the body and they are different from person to person. I will have a different set of sesamoid bones than my friend, except for a very unusual sesamoid bone, which is very large, and we all have this sesamoid bone, and those are the kneecaps, the patellas. The patella is a sesamoid bone. It's just a very special sesamoid bone. But remember, 
sesamoid bones are short bones. They're just a special type. Now, I do want to talk about the difference between long bone and short bone because there's something that a lot of people get confused. Just because a bone is short doesn't mean it is a short bone. For example, the very last digit of the small toe. That's one of the shortest bones in the body, but it's longer than it is wide, so it's a long bone. Just because something is short doesn't mean it is a short bone. And not all long bones are really long. And finally, irregular bones. Irregular bones are bones that do not fit into any of these other categories. For example, the vertebrae. Vertebrae are irregular bones. So now let's talk about gross anatomy of a long bone. Remember, gross just means big enough to be seen with the naked eye. So things that we can see when we look at a long bone. And here over here we see a long bone that has part of it cut away. You have a similar bone to this in lab. So what we can see is both the outside of the bone and the inside of the bone. And what we're seeing here in this image on the left, this is a drawing of a bone that is fresh, that still has all of the, the inside living components. On the right, this is a dried bone of a deceased person. So when we see a skeleton, this is what we would see if we were to open up those bones. If we were to take a living person and remove a bone and look inside of it, we would see over here on the left. So when we look at long bones, there's going to be two major types of osseous tissue, two major types of bone that we find, and that's compact bone and spongy bone. So first we're going to look at compact bone, and we find compact bone on the surface of every bone. We also find it making the walls of the shaft of long bones. So the entire surface of every bone, but also on the walls of the shaft of a long bone. Now we'll talk about what that shaft is actually called here in just a moment, but we're just going to call it the shaft of the bone for right now. And when we look at compact bone, it looks very glossy, very smooth. If we were to touch this, it would feel very smooth. And if we were to look inside, so we cut this bone open, if we were to look at the shaft of this bone, the shaft is hollow. And that hollow area, we can see right over here, this hollow area is called either the marrow cavity or the medullary cavity. And it's called the marrow cavity because we find marrow inside of it. Now, what type of marrow we find inside of it, it kind of depends on the age of the person. In a long bone of a child, the entire long bone is filled with what we call red bone marrow. As we age, the shaft, this marrow cavity, the red bone marrow is replaced with something called yellow bone marrow. Now, we'll talk about red and yellow bone marrow coming up in another lecture, but first let me just say red bone marrow, when you're thinking about bone marrow, you're thinking about red bone marrow. Red bone marrow is what makes blood. That's where hematopoiesis takes place. Yellow bone marrow is fat. So our bones store fat when we are adults. And that fat is stored in the medullary or marrow cavity as yellow bone marrow. The other type is spongy bone. Spongy bone is found in the ends of long bones and making up the inside of all other bone types. 
And spongy bone, when we look at that, well, it got its name because it looks like a sponge. We'll talk more about spongy bone here in just a few moments, but spongy bone looks like a sponge. We can see comparing this compact bone here that looks very smooth, very glossy, to this spongy bone here, there is a stark difference. So now let's go back to uh, the different parts of a long bone. We call this area here the shaft. Well, the shaft is actually called the diaphysis. The shaft of a long bone is called the diaphysis. And each end of the bone, of a long bone, is called the epiphysis. There is a proximal and a distal epiphysis on each long bone. The epiphysis inside of it, that's where we find spongy bone. Inside of the epiphysis of a long bone is where we find spongy bone, plus the other areas that I mentioned. Now, if we look where the epiphysis and the diaphysis meet, depending on the age of the person, there's going to be something called the epiphyseal line or the epiphyseal plate. In a person who is still actively growing and getting taller, this is the epiphyseal plate, sometimes called the growth plate. Once you are full grown and growing has stopped, the epiphyseal plate goes through some changes and just a small mark is left called the epiphyseal line and no growth will occur after that point. So the epiphyseal plate is the growth plate. The epiphyseal line is the remnant of where the growth plate used to be. And we will look at how the epiphyseal plate and epiphyseal line work uh, in lecture number three, I believe. At the end of a long bone, that's where it will form an articulation or a joint with another bone. So it's an area where two or more bones have the potential to rub together. And to prevent that from causing irritation, there's several different things that we find in a joint. There's uh, some stuff called uh, synovial fluid that acts as a lubricant. There's some ligaments and tendons, but there's the end of the bone covered in something called articular cartilage. Articular cartilage is a type of hyaline cartilage. We learned about hyaline cartilage in the lab. Hyaline cartilage covers the ends of long bones at a joint or an articulation. And when we find that hyaline cartilage covering the end of a long bone at an articulation, we call it articular cartilage. Now, if we were to take a bone out of a living person, it will have a membrane covering the bone. And it's pretty thin, and it's kind of clear, and it sticks very, very tightly to the surface of bone, so you might not even realize it. If you've ever, uh, if you're a hunter, and you've removed a bone from an animal, or if you cook and you've gotten meat with a bone inside of it, and you take that bone out, you might not even notice that there's a membrane there because it is held so tightly to the bone surface. But that membrane is there, and it's called the periosteum. Peri means around or on. Ostea means bone. So the periosteum is a membrane that is on the outside surface of a bone. And it's actually a two-layer membrane. Even though it's very thin, it's a two-layer membrane. The outer layer is called the fibrous layer, or the fibrous periosteum. The fibrous periosteum is kind of a tough connective tissue. It's a fibrous connective tissue. It's there for protection. Just deep to that, so actually in contact with the surface of the bone itself is the osteogenic layer, or the osteogenic periosteum. Osteo, again, means bone. 
Jin means to begin or to make or to give rise to. So the osteogenic layer is actually a layer of stem cells. And the osteogenic layer makes some of the bone cells that we will be talking about later. later. Now, this connective tissue layers, this periosteum, these membranes, they're held to the surface of the bone with this web-like structure called Sharpie's fibers or perforating fibers. Sharpie's fibers actually penetrate or perforate the surface of the bone itself, and that allows this membrane to very tightly hold on to the bone. So another thing with the periosteum, in addition to having this osteogenic layer that makes bone, in addition to the fibrous layer that protects bone, the periosteum itself is a point of tendon attachment and ligament attachment. So when two bones are held together, or when a muscle is held to a bone, it actually is continuous with the periosteum. We will talk more about that when we get to the muscle chapter. So maybe make a note to come back and reference this periosteum when we get to muscle. We find a, a layer on the inside also, and it's not really shown in this diagram, but there would be a membrane inside this bone also, and that's called the endosteum. The endosteum is only a single layer membrane, and that single layer is an osteogenic layer. So we have this layer of stem cells both on the outside surface of bone and the inside surface of bone. Now moving away from long bone and talking about short bone, short, I'm sorry, moving away from long bone and talking about flat bone, I apologize. Flat bone is what we see here. This is a flat bone from the skull. Now, flat bones will all have this same general structure. And what we see right here, sometimes we just call the sandwich of flat bone. And they call it that because there is a layer of compact bone on this side and a layer of compact bone on this side. So at the top of this image, this is the outside. So this is called the outer table. And down here, this is the inside. This is where the brain would be on the skull. This is called the inner table. So in a flat bone, there is the outer table and the inner table, both are compact bone. And the sandwich is because between the two tables, we find a very thin layer of spongy bone called diploe. So flat bone has two layers of compact bone with a layer of spongy bone in between, like a sandwich. We have the outer table, the diploe, and the inner table. And this same structure is seen in short, flat, and irregular bones. It's just in flat, we get this very thin sandwich appearance. In short bones and irregular bones, it's quite a bit larger. So that will be where we end this lecture. It was a very short lecture today. The next two lectures will also be pretty short. Um, and then starting in the next lecture, we're going to start looking more at the microanatomy, the histology of this osseous tissue or this bone. If you have any questions, let me know, and I will talk to you next time. Take care.